by the way, guys, we do. I just want to thank you guys for coming in and joining us today. By the way, thank, uh, thank, thank you for having us. Yeah, uh, much appreciated. I know we've been having exchanging words, everybody here, but we do appreciate you guys coming in and um, thanks again. So just to appreciate, just thank you for having us. We're, no, no, enjoy. anytime, anytime, and we welcome you guys to join us more. But definitely, this has been interesting. So please carry on, guys. More okay, more. I, I, I want to thank everyone for being kind in the chat. You guys have uh, been very better, I could say, right now. Um, just to point out, if I um, if my speech slurs, it's because I took my medication. So just like uh, try to bear with it if you can. Sure. Sorry, guys. I'm just trying to find the best translation in modern English so I don't confuse my people. L E B Sam, you had one job. Like some English Bible. Why you want to go with that, bro? What's the problem, man? All because. Okay, then I got it. I got this. I like this one. Modern English version. It's modernized. Okay. Yeah, here it is. John 5. I'm just going to read just the specific parts of John 5. Just specific, and then you guys can engage me. Whatever you want to do, you're free. Uh, John 5, 19. Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. But let's finish it. Then. But what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, likewise the Son does. The Son does whatever the Father does and only what the Father does. We skip to 21 because of time. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but it's committed all judgment to the Son. That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. So you honor me the same way you honor the Father. Not less, not like a prophet, but the way you honor him. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And then 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming. That's the key phrase. The hour is coming. And is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. They're going to hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. So the hour is coming. The dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and live. And then 28, 29. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming, which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So Jesus says he's not the Father. He can do whatever the Father does. In the way the Father does it, give life, raise the dead. And then he says, he, the Son, at the hour, will raise them out of their graves by his voice. And in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Truth and life. Now, why is that interesting? Because Old Testament and the Quran, and I'm just speaking the Quran because you guys believe in it, affirm that at the hour, it is God who gives life to the dead and will raise them from their graves. That's in Surat al-Hajj. Chapter 22, verses 6 to 7 of the Quran, it says, Allah, he gives life, and the hours coming, have no doubt, where <clears throat> he will give life to those in the graves. And even says he's the truth. Allah is the truth, al-Haq. So here in the Quran, Allah is called the truth. He gives life to the dead. And at the hour, Allah will raise them from the graves. All of which Jesus says, he's the one who will raise them from their graves by his voice at the hour. He's the one who gives life to the dead, and he is the truth. Even the Quran acknowledges that the Son is not claiming to be a creature, even though he's not the Father, but one with the Father in essence, even though he's not the same person. So that's just to begin with. So if you guys want to engage, ask, go ahead. So Sam, thank you for that exposition. However, I think you will agree with me that we see the New Testament as a source for the life and teachings of Jesus Christ differently, very differently. So it is my position that the New Testament does not in any shape or no form convey to us true and authentic teachings about Jesus the Christ. I put forward that there are two things that we must hold in mind. I agree with Dan Wallace that we don't have the very words, Ipsisima Verba of Jesus Christ. We have Ipsisima Vox. We don't have any first-hand information, nor do we have any first-party witnesses, which demonstrates that Jesus Christ is God. I, I listened to your exposition and it's wonderful, but something that I, I think you missed perhaps, or maybe you didn't think about it was, well, wait a second. Who is the source of this information and why should you and I take this to be authoritative? I want to point out if Jesus Christ is meant to be God. I think that the, the chapter is Romans chapter 6 verse 9, if I'm not mistaken. Sam can correct me there. Where it says that Christ has overcome or defeated death. Death no longer has mastery or dominion over him. Now the question therefore becomes, wait a second. If Sam follows the philosophy of religion, he knows the term maximum uh, greatest being. Uh, or the maximum being of all. In this case, uh, for Muslims, and Muslims would be aware of this, we believe that God has the attribute of taking life and giving life. He is the source of life and the source of death. There is no disputation about that. Now, it comes into question, for the Muslims, can Allah lose one of his attributes 
and can one of those attributes have mastery over him? This is the case for the Jesus Christ of the New Testament. And so as a monotheist that believes that God's usia cannot be divided, that there is no economic uh, Godhead, I disagree with these principles. And what I would like Sam to do is, does Christ at any one point identify that one, he's a different person from the Father, and two, that he shares the very same essence as God himself? I know he's going to go to John chapter 10. I don't discount that. But the question I put forward is, does Christ understand or does he ever give an exposition where he understands the categories of being and he argues for himself Sam's understanding of the nature of God? Now, I have about a minute, two minutes left. I understand Sam's position. If he assumes that the New Testament is historical, if he assumes that this is from a real and actual Christ, then I understand his point. But evidently, that's just an assumption and it has not been qualified. So I would actually ask Sam to qualify that point before relying upon the text in the first place. So, so I, yeah. I'm going to cut short by two minutes. Uh, either Sam or William can engage. Uh, number one, whether the New Testament is authentic or not, even though that is an important topic and I want to discuss it with you, it is relevant, relevant to the question, does the New Testament teach the deity of Christ? I know you want to talk about who wrote John and even Daniel Wallace that you cited. The same Daniel Wallace argues quite strongly John wrote John, and he wrote it pre-70 AD because he argues on John chapter 5, verse 2. But that's not the, neither here nor there, because to fairly engage this argument, not only do we appeal to historical evidence, but you as a Muslim, you have to then explain to me what the Quran is referring to when it's talking about the scriptures of the Jews and Christians. But if we open up that can of worms, we're not going to focus on the topic. So I'm going to ignore that for now to focus on the topic. Does the New Testament teach the deity of Christ? And... Our words ascribed to Jesus where Jesus claims to be God. We can come back, and I want to come back and talk about historical evidence and the Quranic position about the New Testament, as well as whether the manuscript evidence supports that the Quran you have can be a reliable facsimile that was really originally revealed through Muhammad, because you believe he's a prophet, it was revealed to him. But let's focus on this issue. You mentioned Paul, and you talked about that Jesus overcame death, and somehow God is the greatest conceivable being and he can't lose any of his attributes and i'm assuming by your statement there that you assume that if jesus died he lost one of the attributes that he's ever living and somehow that means he's not the greatest conceivable being neither paul nor john agree with your definition nor does the quran because in john 10 17 18 john 10 17 18 says therefore my father loves me because i lay down my life that i may pick it up again no one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. I received this command from my Father. John 2, 19 and 22. There Jesus says, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. I will raise it up in three days. And the Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and yet you will raise it up in three days? And John says he was talking about the temple of his body. The only way Jesus could raise himself back to life, take back his life, if he was still ever living, he was still conscious. He didn't cease to exist. So implicit in your objection is the assumption that that means secession of life. That's not a biblical definition, nor is it a Quranic one, because you know your Quran better than I do. Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 154, and Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verses 169, 170, it says, those who were killed in the way of Allah, the martyrs, the Sharif, do not say they're dead. Nay, they're living, receiving provision from the Lord, even though you don't perceive how. So even the Quran agrees, that doesn't mean secession of life. And that shows how majestic Jesus is. He is the greatest conceivable being. Because as the greatest conceivable being, he can take on human nature, experience human death, and still be God, still be ever living, and still raise himself back to life. But I'm going to come back to the original point. The things that Jesus said or attributed to him in John, that he is the one who gives life. He's the one who will raise the dead from their graves at that hour by the sound of his voice. Or in John 14, 6, he's the truth. All of that is ascribed to Allah alone. So that means, as far as the New Testament is concerned, even the Quran would agree that the things that Jesus is said to have said can only be said by someone who's God in the flesh, even though he's not the Father. So what stands out to me, Sam, you assumed that the topic is, is Jesus God according to the New Testament? Now you, and as well as I will understand, I am not using as a Muslim, the Bible is not an authority for me. So to quote the Bible to demonstrate that Jesus is God does not qualify the claim in the first place. So for me, my opposition is simple and it's straightforward. You assume that the New Testament is an authority on the historical reality of Jesus' very existence. 
My contention here is that's a false assumption. Therefore, it does not follow, or it is non sequitur, that Christ is demonstrated to be God merely because the New Testament may frame him in that context. So you say here, um, uh, what is the Quranic view of the book of the Christians and Jews? That's another topic. You also say, you assume that I say that Paul says, since Jesus died, he lost an attribute. To be clear, I'm taking Paul on his face value. Paul, on a, uh, in very clear words, says, for death no longer has mastery over him. Now, you have to understand, God cannot have an attribute overpower him because that and that becomes a rival to God. Uh, you mentioned the Quran, Surah 42, verse 11, Laisa Kamitli Hishai, there is nothing like God. So he can't gain and lose attributes. You use a very good term, the uh, greatest conceivable being, again, from William Lane Craig. I accept that point of view, that the greatest conceivable being is God, but implicit in that view is that you can compartmentalize the nature and attributes of God. So for me, it does not suffice that you merely quote the Bible and therefore it qualifies that Jesus is God. Rather, my contention is it's not an authoritative source. Therefore, you cannot assume that it gives you this information accurately. Therefore, it does not qualify that Christ himself is God. I still have two more minutes. I also want to point out here, when you said to me that I have to first accept Paul's view in order to engage with it that Christ is God, I disagree. My perspective is Paul has an understanding and he describes God in such a way that he cannot be God. He is no longer the greatest conceivable being. My problem is not that Christ died. That is a straw man. My point is the text literally says that death no longer has dominion over him. If he is God, nothing can have dominion over him because like you said, the term you used, greatest conceivable being. So you actually need to look at the very nature of God, speak from an ontotheological perspective, because quite simply the Bible does not qualify your claim and it's not an authoritative uh, source of information. I will give my remaining minute to Brother Ibn Anwar if he has anything to say. Brother Ibn Anwar? Yeah, I'd just like to, yeah, thank you. So I'd just like to say that um, Sam is approaching the uh, subject of debate, um, I think, erroneously, because I, I don't think uh, anybody here agreed to the specific topic of the deity of Jesus according to the New Testament. I think the topic was the deity of Jesus, full stop. So to now shackle a jazz or I, uh, or, or me, on uh, <laughs> the uh, phraseology of uh, the deity of Jesus in the New Testament, I think is um, unfair because okay, we did thanks, not agree thank to you. that. Thank you, Ben. I know your time is up. To yeah, okay, my time is uh, up. What, am I responding or is uh, William responding? <laughs> you, you go ahead and reply. You can respond. Uh, actually, even to the title, The Deity of Christ, does presuppose the New Testament. And you guys know it presupposes the New Testament because the only documents you have about Jesus that come from the first century are the New Testament documents. But because you keep wanting to change the topic from the New Testament, I'm really trying to fight the urge to show that you Muslims cannot adopt a method of questioning the scriptures if you're an atheist or agnostic i could then engage you on that level and i can engage let's say bart ehrman on just the textual evidence and even the assertions the assumptions he brings but you're forcing me to show you that yes i can use the new testament against you muslims because your quran forces you to then have me consult my scriptures to then judge according to my scriptures, and we can engage that. So do you want to change the topic, what the Quran says about the Bible, and that even the earliest sources of Islam confirm John as historically reliable, written by John? In Ibn Ishaq, Sirat Rasulullah, read the English translation, Ibn Ishaq, Sirat Rasulullah, <clears throat> the life of Muhammad, and I'll give you even the pages, page numbers, pages 103 and 104. Ibn Ishaq cites, and Ibn Ashan does not edit this, remove this from his edit editing job of Ibn Ishaq, where he says that the gospel that God gave Jesus for the followers of the gospel, which John wrote down as a prophecy of the messenger. And there he quotes John 15, verses 23 to 16, verse 1, and says, John wrote it, and it's a genuine seeing of Jesus because it's the gospel given to Jesus that John wrote about your prophet. So no, you Muslims, you can't play that. If you're going to now want to argue the New Testament, then now I'm going to have to open the Quran and the Sunnah because you believe Muhammad 
and your opinion of the Bible can't be different from Muhammad. So now let's debate. Did Muhammad affirm my scriptures or he thought they were corrupt? And I don't think you want to engage that because the evidence is on my side, not on your side. So yes, when you talk about the deed of Christ, I can shackle you to the New Testament because your prophet shackled you to the New Testament. So you're wrong. So if you want to engage that, we can. If you want to stick with the text, we can. Because I didn't even get to addressing Romans 6 in context, what Paul meant and didn't mean. But it's your 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 call, fellas. This is your house. We're your guests. Uh, we'll have a few other time about the Quran and the Hadith, about the Bible and the Gospel of John. So if you want to go there, we can do that. Uh, we were told, um, Sam was told that it was... Um that nobody agreed to sticking to the New Testament when talking about the deity of Christ. Uh, it's perfectly fine. That's particularly why I told Sam uh, that I'll deal with uh, the apostolic sources, and I'm perfectly fine to do that. I can deal with not only the apostolic era sources, I can deal with the very earliest enemies of the faith, and the earliest enemies of the faith testify to the fact that Christ was viewed as God Almighty by the earliest community, those that knew him, intimately in an intimate fashion those that walk and talk the earth with them so, so <clears throat> you have apostolic sources and you have the enemies of the faith attesting to this there's just a mountain of evidence uh, against the case being presented against the deity of christ it doesn't hold up if we look at the didache and i'm talking about apostolic era sources uh, in the didache it, it applies uh, zechariah 14 1 to christ as yahweh if we look at polycarp I mean, there's so much in Polycarp, uh, so much. Uh, he talks about worship, worship being given to Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and gave, raised Christ from the dead and gave him glory and a throne at his right hand to whom all things in heaven and on earth are subjected, whom every breathing creature, la truo, worships, latria, given to God alone. Clement of Rome is the same. He applies many passages in the Old Testament at referencing Yahweh to Christ, calls Christ Yahweh. Ignatius of Antioch, the same thing, calls calls Christ God, eternal. Uh, uh, our God uh, says both of Mary and of God, God existing in the flesh. I have about 12 seconds, but that is, there's a ton of evidence in the early era, post-biblical era, and in the enemies of the faith that prove the earliest followers of Christ believed he was God Almighty. So, Sam, I like your response. You say, well, you know, the topic presupposes that we have to read the New Testament. And if you have to question the New Testament as an authoritative source, therefore you have to question the Quran and Islamic sources. I am plainly stating, and I'm applying a principle that uh, Michael Lacona uses in his book on the resurrection of Jesus, where he says that there are three forms of uh, methodology. One is methodical credulity, which is what you applied. You take the Bible as the word of God, truthfully in the first place and then you argue against the case made against it so you assume that it's true and you assume that it's historical and you assume that it is preserved and you assume that it is accurate all of these are false assumptions on the other hand i am applying methodical uh, neutrality i'm simply pointing out i'm not appealing to the quran sam you can tell me if i ever quoted one verse in the quran regarding jesus to christ i have no intention of going to the quran because I understand the topic is on the historical Christ and whether or not he claimed it to be God. So the point I put forward to you is quite simple. If you accept the New Testament as an authoritative source and every word in it is instructional, I think as 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16 says, then you carry the burden of proof with you. Merely quoting someone and saying they believe Jesus was God is not evidence. It's merely a claim and each claim must be qualified on its own merits. So I reject your assertion that if we mention the New Testament, then we have to mention the Quran. But me as the Muslim, I'm not appealing to the Quran. I'm appealing to the Greco-Roman context of the New Testament, its sources and its ability to be a truthful and accurate witness for the life of Christ Jesus. So uh, Brother Ibn Anwar, I have about two minutes and 15 seconds. Do you want to take it from here? Yeah, okay, sure. So uh, thank you, uh, Ijaz. Uh, Sam, nothing that you have said thus far convinces me as a Muslim that Jesus, even according to the New Testament, uh, is in fact um, God Almighty. Now you pointed uh, to one text in John where Jesus um, supposedly made the claim, Ana al-Haq, basically, right? Um, that I am the truth. And al-Haq, 
um, uh, in your view, uh, which is correct, it is the Islamic view also, is one of the asma, one of the names of Allah. But the uh, word al-haq in and of itself doesn't, when it is uh, employed in a sentence or in a phrase, doesn't necessarily make the subject or the object uh, God. So if um, we have the book Izhar al-haq, right? That is not talking about God, is it? No, it's talking about truth, truth being revealed. Also, I might point you to um, Al-Hallaj, who yes. said something similar. Ana Al-Haq. Yes, historically, he supposedly was crucified because of his utterance. But um, according to Islamic theology, in traditional Islam, a view that is taken by the majority of uh, traditional Muslims, I would say, including the Deobandis, right? You have Ibn Aqil, for example, Ibn Khafif, Ibn Ata'illah, that great Al -az uh, scholar from Al Azhar, Ibn Qudama, Munawi, Imam Qushayri, and many others. When even when he said Ana Al Haq, that was not actually the individual uh, testifying to his divinity. He may have said it. Um, in a state of ecstasy, in a state uh, where uh, he was emotionally taken, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be him actually arrogating uh, the yeah, position of that. deity to himself. My time is time. up. Yeah. yeah, time is up. Uh, number one, Ibn Anwar, <clears throat> here's my challenge to you. I want you to quote to me a single verse in the Quran or in the Hadith where someone other than Allah says Al Haq. Even your example, Izad Al Haq. It's talking about proclaiming, defending the truth. What truth? Meaning the truth of God's religion. So I didn't say that you can't use the truth to refer to the speech of Allah, to the revelation of Allah, but you need to show me, and here's my challenge, and I want the verse, even I'll extend it to the hadith, show me a person other than Allah saying al-haq. And with that said, you misrepresented my argument. So please, Ibn Anwar. I don't misrepresent yours, not intentionally. I'm going to spend benefit of doubt. You didn't hear me, which is why you misrepresented what I said. So here's my challenge to you. Show me someone other than God in the Old Testament, even the New Testament, in the Quran. We're not mentioning Jesus here because he's in the New Testament, where a prophet says that at the hour, I will raise them with my voice out of the graves. I just showed you in chapter 22, verses 6 to 7, same language, Allah al-Haq, and he gives life to the dead, and the hours coming, have no doubt, he will raise them from their graves, all of which Jesus said he will do as a son of God, not the Father. So represent my argument correctly, because when you just take snippets, that means you can't refute the evidence that Jesus and John claims to be God, though he's not the Father. So that's my challenge to you. And show me a prophet, a prophet, even an angel that says, I am the life, not just the truth, who gives life and will raise them at the last hour. You can't. It's not there. Only Jesus talks like this. So now coming back to what Ibn, uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Hijaz said, Mike Lacona is referring to criteria that can be used to people who are either Christian background or secular agnostic atheist. How to use criteria to determine whether something technically goes back to someone. Now, if I was dealing with an atheist agnostic, if I was dealing with a skeptic, I wouldn't appeal to the Quran because the Quran doesn't matter to them. I'm dealing with Muslims, so whether you don't want to bring the Quran up or not, I am going to bring up the Quran because you are Muslim and you can't use standards against the Bible that goes against the testimony of Muhammad and the Quran and can be used more forcefully against you. So you are shackled. You have to accept the New Testament because your prophet accepted the New Testament. And I'm just going to, be, I'm going to give you two verses. If I cannot know what Jesus said historically, or only know parts of what Jesus said, because the New Testament documents are unreliable, then I want you now to say in front of everyone, I'm no longer a Muslim, I reject Muhammad, so then I can treat you accordingly, as if you're Bart Ehrman, so I don't have to appeal to the Quran. But as long as you're a Muslim, you're stuck with the Quran, because in chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran, and chapter 61, verse 14, your Quran says that God said to Jesus, he will make his followers uppermost dominant, till the day of resurrection, and they'd be victorious, and he gave them the victory. So if the Quran is right, Jesus' true followers triumphed, they were not vanquished, they were not defeated, they were uppermost, they were victorious, and their victory would remain till the day of resurrection. 
But if I agree with you, the New Testament documents, no one knows who really wrote them, meaning the Gospels, and they embellished and they added. That means a group of people came in, destroyed the message of Jesus and his followers, were able to hijack their message because their message got lost and it disappeared. So we cannot know for certain Jesus said this, but the Quran says that can't be the case. That's why even Al-Qurtubi, Al-Qurtubi, cites chapter 61 verse 14, and then cites the tradition of Ibn Ishaq, where Ibn Ishaq cites a tradition, a tribute to your prophet, that when Jesus sent out his followers, he mentions them. And two of the followers, Peter and Paul, who went to Rome, and he mentions Matthew. So if you're a Muslim, you're stuck with it. You're shackled. If you're a Muslim, you have to then accept the Bible. But go ahead. My time's up, I guess. You see my time's up? What is peculiar is you say to me, um, how do I use Lacuna's methodology when it's for Christians and skeptics? To be clear, he uses his own methodology, and this can be applied to anyone that studies historiography. You do not have to be a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, or a secular individual to use the principles of historiography. Where does that rule come from? And can you cite it for me, please? Secondly, you said, well, wait a second. If we can't trust what is written about Jesus in the Bible, then you as a Muslim should give up the Quran. But the point is, I'm not appealing to the Quran for my case. Independent of the Quran, using Greco-Roman uh, literary standards, using sexual criticism, source criticism, I fully understand and agree that Christ Jesus is not God, and we have not a single statement of his which is reliable and can be attested to, which demonstrates that Christ is God. Now, I put the question to you, at what point does Christ receive Latreo? This is almost as James D.G. Dunn, he, who recently passed, when he mentioned the early worship of Christians, he specifies that Latreo is specific to the Father. Now, my further point is, if you say, well, you as a Muslim have to depend on the Quran for this case, not once have I referenced the Quran in this case. And there is no point at which you can show to me the Quran refers to the Kaina Diatheke. Now, one point is to do that. It never says uh, Kitab al Muqaddas. It never says any of those terms. Therefore, or Majmu al Qutb never refers to that in that sense. Now, Sam, you earlier argued, and you actually agree with me, even though you might shake your head, no, maybe, but you agreed with me that there is no one group of Christians. In the same way, there is no one group of Jews or Muslims. Now, when the Quran refers to the people of the book, you automatically assume it refers to people like you. But at no point did any companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or the Prophet himself ever derive thick rulings from the writings of the Jews and the Christians in his day. Sorry, so I, I think I've made the case and I've made my point. One does not need to be a secular individual or an atheist to apply, to apply the principles of historiography. That is what we must do, and it's a standard uh, methodology within scholarship. Brother Ibn Anwar, we have two minutes. Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, but I do not accept your... Uh, uh, framework that I have to only look at the Quran and the Sunnah. I am not a Salafi, and neither is Ijaz. Uh, traditional Muslims, proper Sunni Muslims, we accept Quran, Sunnah, Qiyas, and Ijma. And within that, we have Al Ulama Waratatul Anbiya, that the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. So I give you an example, a historic, historical example of Al Hallaj, and he did say historically, Ana Al Haq. And according to the um, understanding of our ulama, that did not make him blasphemous because even with those words, um, uh, uh, that did not uh, take him out of the fold of Tawheed. <clears throat> we can interpret uh, such sayings and the scholars have done that. <clears throat> and with regards to Jesus, uh, ra raising the dead, well, and being the key to resurrection. If you look at John uh, 11, right, where Jesus said to the person, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, etc.? So here he's obviously talking about something beyond physical reality. He's not talking about actual death because that's people time, that's do time. die. Ibn Anwar, Yo, time. My time Ibn Anwar, time Ibn Anwar, that's time. Okay, let me work backwards and forwards. Number one, uh, Ibn Anwar, uh, you probably, again, I'm probably speaking fast, which is why maybe you're not getting the point. It's irrelevant to the discussion. 
what later Muslim scholars say, because you still believe that Muslim scholars cannot contradict the Quran and Hadith. And it's ironic, you keep mentioning Ibn Halaj when you admit he was killed for that claim. So either you're going to say the Muslims who killed him were nuts and didn't know what they're talking about, or the very fact that they killed him means that some people realize this is a claim that cannot be uttered by a mere mortal, even though your preferred scholars think it can be, which is why I told you, let's establish it from the Quran and the Sunnah, because your scholars are disagreed. You named a few, but I can name others that would disagree with you. The very ones who killed him for making that a even though he was simply saying that he was filled with the presence of Allah, not that he was Allah, but still that was blasphemous. So go to the Quran and the Sunnah again. Secondly, you made, again, you made the mistake of not dealing with my argument. And I'm going to be terrible and say, benefit of doubt, I'm speaking too fast. I'm not talking merely about Jesus giving spiritual life, which in of itself is something that only God can do. So here's a further challenge. Quote to me in the Quran and quote to me in the Old Testament, where someone other than God not only gives physical life, but spiritual life. And then you quoted John eleven twenty five, 25, where Jesus, I am the resurrection, al bayt right? And I am the life. Show me any prophet, any messenger that says, I am the resurrection life, and then does a miracle by raising someone physically to prove that he is such. But you ignore what I said. Jesus said, at the hour he, by his voice, will raise people from their graves. That's physical, not simply spiritual. Can you show me someone other than Allah that raises people at the hour from their graves? You can't. Only God does. So whether you're not convinced, it's irrelevant. The truth is staring you in the face. Jesus is claiming to be God in the flesh. So let me deal with Ijaz. Ijaz, to, to try to escape the burn of proof and appeal to modern criteria, when that's a criteria that was unknown to your prophet, unknown to his companions, unknown to the Christians in the first century, in the second century, and third century, again, I'm going to say, you're not really dealing with the impact of my argument. To mention 20th or 21st century criteria that was not used to determine truth. That's not what your prophet did. He didn't play appeal to this criteria to determine what Jesus said centuries prior. So I'm going to ask you as a Muslim, I'm going to bind you as a Muslim to your sources, shackle to your sources. Use your prophet's method of determining historicity, not a method brought up by 20th or 21st century scholars, unknown to your prophet, unknown to his companions, unknown to the people before him, unknown to Jesus' followers. That's not what they did to determine truth. And then let me correct you. The Quran does speak of the Kitab. When you said it doesn't say Kitab al muqaddis Nor does the Quran call any book Muqaddis. So here's my challenge. Show me the Quran where any book is called Muqaddis. It doesn't use that phraseology. So instead of insisting to have the Quran speak in a language other than it speaks, deal with the language of the Quran. In chapter 2, verse 113, it says, the Jews and the Christians read the Kitab. That would be the Arabic equivalent of the Bible. And I mentioned to you Ibn Ishaq confirming the Gospel of John as written by John, because Ibn Ishaq wasn't a 21st century quote-unquote historian, he took for granted that what the Christians told him was right because he worked under the assumption, which you should be working under, that the Quran is right. Jesus' followers triumph. That means their message triumph because you can't have a victory when the message is destroyed. That's not a victory, that's a defeat. And since the Gospels are the only Gospels that have been preserved, that means they have your God's blessing and we can use them to judge whether Jesus claimed to be God. And I think my time is up. Yeah, so can I respond very quickly? Uh, then, yeah, go, go ahead, Ibn Anwar. So let me just get yeah. the time. You may begin when okay, ready. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, uh, Sam, uh, it's uh, Mansur al Hallaj, not Ibn al Hallaj. So Mansur al Hallaj did oh. make that claim, Ana al Haq. But there is disagreement as to why actually he was crucified. Some say that it was because of the political turmoil at the time, and he became unfor an unfortunate victim of um, circumstance. Others say that he was um, was crucified specifically because of his utterance. So there is a disagreement on why exactly he was actually crucified. But according to the major scholars that I have referred to, I've men uh, mentioned them, Ibn Atta'illah, for example, who is not just any Tom Dick or Harry, is one of our premier scholars, um, from the premier scholars at Al Azhar uh, in Al Qaeda, <coughs> excuse me, uh, who also debated Ibn Taymiyyah at one point. So they have said that despite his utterance, that did not take him out of Islam. 
He said that in the state of Fana, that's one possibility. And uh, that would not make him a deity. Now, you cited the text in John, John chapter 5, verse number 28, and you repeated it several times. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out those who have done good, etc., etc. The text doesn't say that Jesus is going to uh, order them to come out and because of his command of his instruction is going to come out that is your interpretation the text doesn't say that the text says that they're going to hear his voice and that's it you're interpreting that voice as in as if it, it's a command for them to come out to the graves and now they're going to come out because he gave them the ability to come out that's your interpretation the text doesn't actually say that uh i just go ahead yep. Okay, so I have about a minute and 12 seconds. Thank you, Brother Ibn Anwar. So, uh, Get ready to said, modern criteria method was unknown to the first Muslims. You refer to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his companions. I want to point out Quran 16, uh, chapter, uh, verse 125, tells us, ability, uh, ability uh, here, Ahsan, to argue in the best way. Argue, not quarrel. So, argue means you use in logic. How do we know this in Quran 2 uh, 10? I think it's verse 100. It mentions that. The best of people generally uh, are those who use reason and those are defiled who do not use reason. So this is in fact a method uh, entrenched within the Quran and I have to shackle you to the New Testament. So you cannot escape the problem of Jesus' lack of deity. So I'll point out some things that you mentioned. You said, well, wait a second, Jesus' message is Jesus's message one, therefore, you know, the Christians are right. Small problem there. Jesus' message, according to the understanding of Muslims, it's the ijma, it's the consensus, that the Muslims are the ones referred to in that verse. You know and I know that Muslims believe the followers of Jesus were Muslim, and we believe that we are the spiritual inheritors of the message which Christ Jesus conveyed. So we as Muslims have no problem with that. You, the Christian, find yourself in a difficult position because I've noticed you've moved the discussion to the Quran and you are unable to establish Christ's deity from the New Testament. So again, Sam, if you have any shred of credibility, and you do have some, you need to establish the reliability of the New Testament text and its ability to convey the message. And I will hold you to what the early church father says. So here is what um, Dale C. Allison Jr. mentioned in his book, The Historical Christ and Theological Jesus. He says, even more clear-eyed was Origen, who in the third century anticipated modern criticism by candidly observing that at many points the four Gospels do not agree. He inferred that their truths cannot reside in the material letter. The evangelists sometimes altered things which from the eye of history occurred one or otherwise. They could speak of something that happened in one place as if it happened in another, or what happened at a certain time as if it happened at another time. And they were in uh, the spiritual Hi. truth. Okay, let me Sorry. just finish. Can I finish the sentence? Just one sentence. Yeah. The spiritual truth was often preserved, one might say, in the spiritual falsehood. And I will post a reference in the chat if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, Ibn Anwar, please, let's not nitpick. Just like I mistakenly called Ijaz Ibn Ajaz, I know his name is not Ibn Halaj. The fact that you made an issue out of it, it's getting pretty petty. But now let me read to you, and you don't accept him, but that proves my point. It proves the point. You can appeal to any scholar you want, even Atiyah, who's much later, that's still not more authoritative than the Quran and the Sunnah. You failed miserably to prove your point from the Quran and Sunnah, and I don't blame you because you know you can't. But here, I'm going to read Abu Amina Bilal Phillips in the Foundation of Islamic Studies. The statement of Al Halaj, you know, saying, An Al Haq, you know, I am the embodiment of truth. You know, as Allah said, describing himself, Wahul Haq, he describes himself as being Al Haq. For any Muslim to say Anul Haq, he is basically saying I'm Allah. Bam! Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. Now you can throw him under the bus and say, well, I don't agree with him. He's Salafi. Tough luck. Because you're not an authority and your scholars are not an authority. This is why I say go to the Quran and the Sunnah, prove your point. I can name my scholars. You can name my schools. My school beat your scholar. Stop appealing to authority. This is a fallacious line of argument. The only time appealing to authority is inclusive. When your authority has the evidence of your primary sources, and it doesn't. So let me repeat what Abu Amin Abil al Philip said. Any Muslim to say An al Haq is basically saying, I'm Allah. So he says, Ibn Anwar, you have no idea what you're talking about. And then you did something that really disturbs me because you've been doing it all night to my scriptures, and I've yet to misquote your Quran. You haven't been able to show me where I misquoted your Quran. You said, All Jesus said is that they'll hear his voice, and then I assume they'll come out. So let's now go with your reasoning. John 5, 28, 29. Do not marvel 
at this, for the hour is coming, all are in the graves, will hear his voice and come out. No, it doesn't mean what the text says. See, Jesus is just going to be speaking out loud to the birds. Hey, birds, you hear my voice? And then just coincidentally, they're going to come out of their graves. Please, friend, do not butcher my scriptures this way because it's going to end up embarrassing you. So the text is clear. The hour is coming where the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will come out. And then 28, 29, the dead who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. The result is hear their voice. That's why they come out. So I'm going to press you again, Ibn Arwar. Quote to me a single ayah from the Quran and Hadith where someone other than your God says, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the resurrection. And at the last hour, someone other than your God will raise them from their graves. It's there. It's smacking you in the face. I know you don't like it, but I'm sorry. The Bible wasn't written by a Muslim. It was written by a Trinitarian. Coming back to the issue. Again, Ijaz didn't hear what I said. I said that Al-Qurtubi quoted chapter 61, verse 14. Al-Qurtubi, who said that this was fulfilled when Allah gave victory to the, to the followers of Jesus. Those who were victorious and sent out with the victorious message, Peter and Paul. And Al-Qurtubi -Qur Al doesn't say Daif or, you know, this is fake. This is how God kept his promise. He empowered Peter, Paul, Matthew, and others, John, sent them out throughout the whole world to spread this message, a message that is dominated from the time of Jesus till the day of resurrection. And I know you Muslims want to say it's about Islam. That's not what the verses say. 355 and 6114, and repeat, it says to Jesus, I'll make your followers victorious from when? When he was taken to Allah till the day of resurrection. It doesn't say, They'll be victorious for a short while. The message will be destroyed. Then the Muslims will come in and they'll repair the message, restore the message, and then it'll dominate their resurrection. I know you don't like the way the Quran is written, but I'm simply quoting the Quran as it is, and it confirms my point, not yours. And you are bound to the New Testament and not an atheist, and you're not bound to me. So I'm going to hold you accountable to your Quran. You have to respect my New Testament. Anyway, go ahead. So, uh, Sam. Uh, thank you for quoting to me uh, Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. But anybody who knows me knows that I disagree wholeheartedly with him and he, uh, the whole of Salafism. I told you already that we are traditional Sunni mainstream Muslims. Salafism is heterodox. It's like me quoting um, Catholicism. Catholic theologians and saying that you must now adhere to their dictates with regards to theology. Of course, you're not going to accept that being a Protestant. <clears throat> so yeah, know, it's like that. Uh, so thank you, Sam. Yeah, uh, I and I do not think Abu Amina Bilal Phillips would actually equate himself with Ibn Qudama or Al Munawi or Ibn Aqil or Ibn Khafif. He would not. He would say that he. <laughs> he would consider himself a pupil of these great scholars of Islam, including Ibn Atayillah. <clears throat> these are some of the giants of our religion in mainstream Sunni Islam. So please, thank you, but no thank you. Uh, with regards to John chapter 5, I did not misquote anything. I read what you read. You inserted your interpretation. I did not do that. I merely read what the text says, and the text doesn't say that because of his voice, they got life and got resurrected. That is not what the text says. That's your interpretation that you've inserted into the text, which the text does not say. I just okay. your, your mind. Thank you for your response, Sam. I noticed that in the four minutes you had, you repeated John chapter 5, verse 28 to 29, and you also referenced al Qurtubi on Quran Surah 3, verse 35. However, I said to you, it's the ijma, or it's the consensus of the Muslims, that this refers to the Muslims. Now you will say to me, but you as a Muslim have to believe that. Well, you as a Christian equally must believe that the New Testament teaches that Jesus is God. I don't interpret your scripture for you. I actually let you explain it. So from our perspective, no, this does not refer to Jesus and the Christians who apply to them. I'll make a simple point by this. If I were to ask a Christian, are you a monolith? The answer will be no. So if your argument is that the most successful group would be among the Christians, then Sam, you should become a Catholic today. But you will not become a Catholic. I know some of your beliefs have changed. William should be the one saying, yes, this verse refers to me. But you as a Protestant or quasi-Orthodox believer cannot make that claim. You will notice, Sam, the question is, is Jesus God? 
I put the question to you to demonstrate that to me, but you focused only on the Quran because I personally believe that you do not have an answer to the question. You can uh, shift the goalposts, but unfortunately, it does not work for you. Now, John chapter uh, 5, verses 1 to 5, demonstrate for me that this work is not from God and that it actually has errors. So I want to point out in verse 1, after this, there was a festival of Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Problem, the definite article before the word festival is missing. I think it's just letter uh, eta, if I'm not mistaken. And so did he go to the festival, which would be Passover, or any random festival? Already the question of the historicity of this passage comes into question. You know as well, when it mentions in verses 3 and 5, the angels move in the water, a later addition. So the question then becomes, if this work is authentic, and we have all of these emendations which contradict history, for example, the pillars at the pool, I think the, 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 the white fathers in the French ex, uh, expedition to Jerusalem points out that the number of colonnades are actually wrong. I think it's off by one. So this chapter tells me that this book was not written by a person who knew Jesus can testify the truth about him, and therefore it is not an accurate source of information. The burden of the proof is upon you. Please give me that statement of La Treo. It's been four turns. You haven't given it. Thank you. Uh, Ibn Anwar, you just ended up proving my very point. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips, you disagree with him with Salafi. He'd say, you're the heterodox. So we can be mudslinging, you know, my scholar can defeat your scholar. And Abu Amina Bilal Phillips did you better. He went to the Quran and Sunnah, he went to your prophet, not to some scholar centuries later that you agree with. But you know what? Hey, let's damn Abu Amina Bilal Phillips for taking the Quran and the Sunnah at face value. So your words with me, it's against Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. And in all these rebuttals, you still miserably failed. Well, let me repeat it. You miserably failed to quote a single example from your Quran or Hadith or the Old Testament, which you don't believe in the Old Testament, put aside, where someone other than Allah says, I am truth, I am the life, the resurrection. You even quoted Jesus saying, I'm the life. And talk about desperate. In fact, it's even insulting to hear you even say this. So now I'm going to let you exegete John 5, 20, 29. Tell us what the connection is with these words. Do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Do the tap dance. Come back and tell me what's the connection with one and the other because one follows the other. You exegete it. Don't tell me what it doesn't mean. Tell me what it means. Now coming back to Ibn Anwar. Uh, Ijaz, Ijaz, you again help make my case that you be a Muslim. So I want you to come and say I'm not a Muslim because your fit confirmed the scriptures in the possession of the Christians in the sixth century. Even Ibn Ishaq says that John wrote down the gospel that contained a prophecy of Muhammad. So now I'm going to return the favor to you. The copies that the Christians had at the time of Muhammad, did they have did the gospels of John? Did it have the definite article or not before the festival? That's number one. Number two, the copies that your prophet confirmed, in the possession of the Christians, which would include the copies of John, because we even know Ibn Ishaq later knows they have John, and they believe John wrote to gave to Jesus. Does it have that very angel string? The pool? The burden's on you to answer because you say yes. Your prophet confirmed the story of the angel string the pool. Your prophet confirmed whether the article should be before the festival or not. See, you're not Bart Ehrman. You can't use these arguments. You're a Muslim. You're stuck with your prophet confirming my scriptures and what those scriptures looked like at the time of the Christians. He didn't say, oh, because there's no definite article, it's corrupt. No, what you have, the uncorrupt words of God, judge by them. We can debate that. It's not I'm changing the goalpost. I'm holding you honest and responsible to what you're supposed to believe as a Muslim. So please, I'll answer for everyone. Name the copies of John in the 6th century, 7th century, 7th century. And tell us which of those copies had the article, didn't have the article, and how many of them didn't have the story of the angels during the pool, and whether those copies were in the possession of the Christians in Arabia, because whatever they had, Muhammad said, true, uncorrupt, judged by them, and we can talk about that. So again, don't argue like an agnostic or an atheist, you're not. And to correct you, Qurtubi did say the followers of Jesus that Allah gave the victory to, and it's not about ijma and consensus. Peter and Paul, because he knew historically the only followers of Jesus that were sent out that dominated were folks like Peter and Paul. But then Peter and Paul were uppermost. Where does it say then their message would be destroyed? 
lost only parts of it would remain until muhammad revived it it's not there i'm just going by the quran and the hadith if you don't want me to go by the quran because you reject the quran say it i don't believe on it's a fraud i won't use these arguments then we'll be consistent but no the evidence is against you you're stuck with my new testament and jesus claims to be god and i'll go to latro and other passages not just on five but john five has been too hot to handle none of you have been able to refute it glory to jesus christ Right. So, Sam, it's been about six turns, and the one question I asked you've been unable to address. Is the term latreo ever used for Jesus? The answer is no. James D.G. Dunn, who recently died, confirmed that on his work on the early Christian worship. Now, it's interesting that you appeal to Bilal Phillips and say, well, you've got to accept whatever he says. Well, just to remind you, it's Quran, Sunnah, Ijman, Piyas. One man does not make ijma, just to be clear. So your, your understanding of Islam is deficient in that respect. Secondly, you said to me, and it's a very strange argument, my prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, confirmed your Bible. Here's the question I put to you, because I know you have the answer. Do you have a single manuscript of the New Testament circulating in Arabia, extant to the time of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from the uh, terminus uh, post crime of 610 to the terminus anti crime of 632. You do not have that. So you're appealing to the Christians at that time and say, well, whatever they had, we also had. I want to point out in Dr. Brent Nongbu's book, uh, Jesus, uh, sorry, uh, what's his book's name? A God's Library. He points out that from the second to the ninth century CE in Oxyrhynchus and villages along the Nile, that they actually copied more non canonical and deuterocanonical works more than the New Testament writings. So it stands to reason, therefore, it's a false assumption to believe or assert that the Christians in Arabia had the same data that you appeal to. It's quite clear from the manuscript testimony from uh, God's Library, the book by Dr. Brent Nongbui, the Deuterano, Deuterocanonical, and uh, uh, just the general books outside of the canon were copied and used more by Christians in that area. Lastly, it's very strange that you say, Kultubi says Peter and Paul. Here's the question I put to you. Does Kultubi say the Christians of his day, the Roman Catholics, which were the major religion at his point, does he say they are upon the right path? That is the religion we should follow. No, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, recites from the Quran, this refers to Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 where God is referred to as a son who is delivered, who is born unto us. The Quran uses the Hebrew equivalent in Arabic to refute that point of view. So if your argument is that the Quran affirms the Bible, debunked. If your argument is that Jesus is worshipped and you can demonstrate it from the Bible, you have failed to do so summarily. Lastly, I put the question to you, I read the quote from, uh, from uh, Origen, who directly says the truth is contained within the material falsehood. And I pointed out to you that John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, including the healing of the blind man, are later additions, which James White also agrees with. So you stand against the majority of Christian scholarship because you do not want to concede the point that you have zero evidence that Christ was worshipped as the one true God from uh, the scripture itself. Uh, what's your name again, Ibn Anwar? You may go one minute. Yeah, thank you. So, Sam, I don't know why you insist that I or Ejaz, who belong to mainstream Sunni Islam, adhere to the words of Abu Amina Bilal Phillips, who actually anathematized me and anyone else that belong to mainstream Sunni Islam who believe in things like tawassul or istirata. Bilal Phillips specifically made takfir or said that anyone who calls upon the Prophet Muhammad commits shirk. Excuse me. We are Sunni Muslims who believe that it's okay to say, Ya Muhammad, whom, which Bilal Phillips says, it can be tantamount to shirk and is haram. No, we do not accept the fatawa of the Salafis when it comes to theological matters like these. Okay, we, we, we would follow our scholars, and in our tradition, there is something called Al Aslu Fil Ashia Al Ibaha. This is a very known uh, maxim in. Oh, my time is up. Yeah, time, that's time, yeah. Uh, again, neither Ijaz or Ibn Anwar heard me correct, and I'll say it's my fault I'm speaking fast, or if they did, they're misrepresenting me because they don't have reputation. I didn't say you had to subscribe to the opinion of Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. You're misrepresenting. I said the very fact there are Muslims who disagree with you, and the very fact there are Muslims 
who condemn you and you condemn them, is all the more proof. I don't care about your scholar. My scholar can beat your scholar. Go back to the Quran and the Sunnah, which you have yet to do. This is now what times sees you have yet to quote a single verse from the Quran. Yet to quote a single verse from your Hadith where someone other than Allah says he is the truth, he is the resurrection, he is the life, and someone other than Allah will raise the dead from their graves. You have yet to do that. So by that, you admit you have no refutation. Coming back to Ijaz, again, Ijaz, when you tell me that Qurtubi think the Christians at that time were true believers, that's irrelevant to his exegesis of 6114. When he interprets 6114, and he knows this is supposedly addressed to Jesus in the first century and promising Jesus, his followers will be victorious, Al-Qurtubi has no choice but to look at the history to see who are those followers that were made victorious. And he has no choice because there are no other followers. Because all the documents that prevailed and disseminated throughout the world say it's Paul and Peter and John and Matthew. But he didn't reason out the implication and he's avoiding the implication like you are. If they were the true followers and they were victorious, that means their message was true. And if their message is true, then God preserved it. Well, the message he preserved is the writings of the New Testament. And that's why it's still spreading like wildfire all over the world. Which is why you're arguing tooth and nail against its veracity and against its statements because you know this message exposes Islam and proves Jesus is God in the flesh. Now let me correct again your challenge to me. I don't know if you're referring to the Arabic versions of the Gospels not being extant in the 7th century. Even if you believe that, then that means you're not a Sunni because according to Sal Bukhari, volume 1, number 3, we know there was a Gospel in Arabic written by Waraka bin Nofo. So do you reject that? Well, I, I wouldn't blame you to reject it because it comes over 100 years after the death of your, your prophet. Since you're a Sunni, you are going to have to agree with your tradition. There were Gospels in Arabic because Waraka bin Nofl wrote the Gospel in Arabic and he would write it in Hebrew, which some say it meant Syriac. So why are you going against your sources? Just because we don't have any extant manuscript evidence doesn't mean none existed. But more than that, you don't need it to be in Arabic for the Gospels and the New Testament writings to be in circulation because they could be in all the different languages. Even at the time of Muhammad, the Christians would have been reading Syriac. Syriac would have been the language they read. So I'm gonna issue my challenge to you again. The copies of John in all the languages in the seventh century, especially to the Arabs, it doesn't have to be Arabic, in Syriac, in Coptic, you name it. Did it contain the definite article before the festival and didn't have the angel stirring the waters. In other words, the seventh century copies of John didn't have it. If it did, you're stuck with it. You have to amend it. You have to accept it because your prophet said those are the uncorrupt words of God. Let me give you the verses real quickly to show you he was confirming those scriptures that existed at that time, not some scriptures that didn't exist that we're just going to make up out of our imagination. Chapter 2 of the Quran, verses 40 to 44. Chapter 2 of the Quran, verses 89 to 91. Chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 97. Chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 101. Chapter 2, verse 113. Chapter 2, verse 121. Chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Chapter 3, verses 113 and 114. Chapter 4, verse 47. Chapter 5, verses 43 and 48. Chapter 10, verse 37, verse 94. Chapter 12, verse 111. Chapter 46, Five. verse 12 and verse 30. Game over. My Bible's uncropped and you're bound to it. Right, okay. Thank you. So, Jess, can I respond very quickly? So, Sam, again, I don't, I don't, uh, it's very difficult for me to comprehend that you, you're having such difficulty understanding either Jess or I telling you that we are not shackled by only the Quran and the Sunnah. In traditional Sunni mainstream Islam, our sources are Quran, Sunnah, Qiyas, Ijma, and Qiyas. Do you understand that? These are the four main sources now we are not obligated to follow the solitary position of this or that scholar especially if that scholar comes from a heterodox school can you understand that much in our traditional sunni islam we have something called al aslu fil ashya al ibaha this is a this is um the uh, maxim that is subscribed to by the jumhur of the ulama in sunni islam that is the original status of anything is al ibaha permissibility so what you and bilal phillips need to do is to provide 
if you think that you are a mustanbid, someone who can actually perform istimbat when it comes to our um, um, major sources of the Quran and the Sunnah, i.e. extracting legal rulings from the main text, you think you're a mujtahid, a person who can do istimbat, and you think Abu Amina Bilal Phillips has that ability, what you need to do is provide qat'i dilalah from the main nusus to show that it is haram in any shape or form in any situation for any person to say ana al haq or to say ana al hay or to say ana al rahman for example in any situation if you can provide a qat'i the dalil something that needs no interpretation this is as clear as the day qat'i i know you don't understand that terminology so if you can provide evidence like that then you would have something but you do not but then, Anwar, do you mind if i jump yeah, in thank you i guess your 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 mind very strange that the christian is arguing what our sources of our deen are very strange uh, only muslims can do that so sam i put that challenge to you now it's interesting that you say but well, wait a second there was a gospel by waraka and therefore we must accept that one uh, that that hadith that you put did the prophet say that we have to accept it no uh hold on your argument is that whatever existed in the seventh century wherever it is in the world and it was the new testament therefore the quran affirms it at no point does the quran affirm the new testament or the old testament in fact it does the direct opposite in quran surah 2 verses 1 uh, uh verse 75 to 79 surah 6 verse 91 these points to the corruption of the previous scriptures, which we reject in total. Uh, to follow up on the point that you made as well, but wait a second, if it exists at this time, therefore it must mean we must affirm it. Here is the challenge. Quote for me one manuscript that is extant that qualifies your claim, because I already pointed out in Oxyrhynchus and along the Nile, the Christians there were not limited to the New Testament. So you may, you're forcing a boundary and the limitation which does not actually exist. And we know as a matter of fact, that the northern tribes in Arabia, in the northeast and the northwest, the border in between the Roman Empire and the Mesopotamians, so, sorry, Sasanians, they actually had beliefs which contradict yours. They actually affirm dynamic monarchianism, some were Nestorians. So are you affirming their writings as well? The answer is simply no. All of this, and an A try some, not once have you shown me in the New Testament where Latreo is done towards Jesus. That was the one challenge. You filibustered for eight sessions, 32 minutes, I'm not wondering. Okay, yeah, I, I think that, uh, that Sam has made a number of excellent points uh, that seem to be lost. Um, uh, our, our interlocutors have been saying that uh, in the particular region that they were copying a lot of the deuterocanonical books, capitalists would call them deuterocanonical. Uh, really, that does nothing to help your position at all. That actually damages your position because we agree to that. The problem is, is that they were quoting the deuterocanon to hearken to passages that particularly referred to the deity of Christ. That is what they were doing. So we have church fathers in those regions that were hearkening to books like Sirach, Wisdom, and many others, and viewing and pointing out prophecies of Christ and the deity of Christ. So that does nothing to help the case, your case at all. Excuse me. Furthermore, if we look at the earliest, speaking of Jews, uh, the earliest Jewish sources that were aware of the earliest Christians. We look at Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is noting that there was one Christian community at the time, and that community were quoting from the Gospels and quoting from the Deuterocanon to talk about Jesus being Yahweh, Jesus being God. You have that very, very early on. Uh, I brought up a number of uh, of apostolic fathers. I brought up Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, I brought up uh, uh, Clement of Rome. Uh, and, and really, the, these, these fathers have got to be dealt with. Uh, Ignatius of Rome has got to, Ignatius of Antioch has got to be dealt with. Uh, Polycarp has got to be dealt with. And, and the argument that, well, you know, manuscripts that are corrupt or what have you, it, it really isn't going to fly. It isn't going to fly here. Because that's that, that if, if, if anybody's going to take that position, that's a real poor position to take. Because we have a lot of their writings preserved in other fathers, such as Irenaeus. And we know that these people were trained, Polycarp trained by John, then we'll hear the old canard. Well, does Polycarp ever quote from John? 
And yes, he does. Polycarp knew John. These people were trained and taught by the apostles, and they are teaching the deity of Christ, the fact that Christ is Yahweh, God Almighty. Sam brought up an incredible point that was just, you know, ignored. Either it probably ignored because people really don't know how to deal with it. But the church fathers, I know, using the old canard, that, oh, well, they were in this story and in this and this. We're not quoting the story in fathers. There are a ton, and I can drop their names. I'm just waiting for the moment. I can drop their names. There are plenty from that region that spoke Arabic. They spoke it, and they quote from the Bible. They quote the passages that show the deity of Christ, and I know it's not the topic today, but the bodily resurrection. They quote all of these. So that argument is a poor one. There are patristic figures that existed in these regions. They preserve biblical texts from this period. I mean, any which way you look, you're going to get buried under the church fathers. And it is not, it is not an argument that anybody, anybody can logically contend against. Uh, briefly touching upon uh, um, uh, Latruo, uh, Sam is going to go into that. And he's going to touch upon uh, other passages. Uh, I, I, I would point uh, to one thing, and that can be dealt, at, dealt with later. Uh, the Son of Man, and yes, I'm aware of every single, and this, listen to my words carefully, every single interpretation of that from antiquity, even the heretical ones, I am aware of every single one, because I've written a paper on it, I'm not aware of anyone else that has gone as in-depth, and that is a clear title of deity, and the Son of Man receives the true. So it's interesting you say that the documents at Oxyvencus are okay because Christians use the deuterocanonical works. The problem is, do you know the works that were circulated in Oxyvencus and in the villages around it that were published by the Christian scribes at that point in time? Just give me a book that is deuterocanonical that was popularly uh, recorded in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th century, which uh, provide your point of view. So the, the point stands that, guess what? There are works which they rejected. You as a Christian will reject. What I need you to do is give me a list of three of the works that were specifically uncovered. I'm going to give you a reference. It's in Dr. Brent Nongbu's book. He actually has a chart on page 248. And he actually quite clearly states non-New Testament manuscripts, they always, always outnumbered the Christian manuscripts. That includes the New Testament. So the point stands... Okay, I, you. I thank you, Ibn Anwar. So the point stands thereby that you've made an error in reasoning. If it is that you can identify the works which were deuterocanonical, that they were copying in those cities, you may have a point. So just give me a few and let's see and provide a quote and citation for it. You said uh, Ignatius and the other fathers agreed that Christ was God. Now, it's funny that uh, Origen says the material, sorry, the truth was, spiritual truth was preserved in the uh, material falsehood. That's even more peculiar because when you reference uh, Ignatius, Corpus Ignatium is actually from the 9th century CE. And in the link I've put into the chat, and in the link that I've uh, sent you via email, it's a manuscript of the early Christian fathers. Uh, at the very last paragraph, it says, consequently, the editing of Justin texts is almost entirely a matter of conjectural amendation, which is necessary in places, but has certainly been employed too freely by some editors. So what stands here? We know that the writings of the early church fathers were amended and edited at will, and there were many, the court used conjectural emendations. This is the work by Cyril C. Richardson. So therefore the point stands, I'm actually correct on that. Now what is peculiar is that none of you seem to give evidence that Christ was God. Your evidence seems to be, well, Christians thought he was God, therefore he was God. How is that not circular reasoning? I want to point out as well, a Hindu tells me that Krishna is God. Oh, that, that, I guess that's it then. I got to be like you and Sam and become a Hindu. No, the point is we do not take that statement as a testament to belief. All Sam has to do, and you too as well, uh, William, you have to provide the earliest writings that testify that Christ is God, which is extant to us today, and then we can work backwards. Scholars always use as a foundational principle, they identify their sources, try to reconstruct them, give us a terminus postquem and a terminus antiquem. Simple terms, simple ideas. None of you have seemed to be able to give us evidence that Christ was God. Your, your only argument is either Christians say he's God, therefore he's God, or the Bible, as I interpret it, says he's God, therefore he's God. None of those are good enough. Sam is pretty strange because he says, oh, wait a second, uh, you have all these verses in the Quran which affirm his scripture. 
Just do me one favor, Sam, one favor. If the Quran affirms the New Testament, just show me one place at which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or his companions used as a form of the deal or evidence the New Testament. Nowhere. And if it was extant to his time, then you would be able to demonstrate this for me. It seems to be the case that you are unable to do so. I'm very interested in what you come up with, Latreo. It took you, what, 10 sessions, 40 minutes. Let's see what you have. I give up the rest of my time so Sam can uh, provide the evidence. Okay. okay. A, a number of points were made. Uh, you said that you emailed me, uh, and I looked over what you emailed me. It, it doesn't make any difference. Um, we need to stop pretending that uh, when something says that there has been an emendation, that that means that that is akin to a corruption. We need to be serious for a moment here. Anybody that has taken any introductory course to textual transmission or the history of it will tell you that is not what an emendation means. It doesn't mean, well, you know what? Uh, we can't know what is said here. I have before me the critical edition of Justin Martyr in the Greek, and I'm looking at the passages that Sam and myself have quoted. I'm looking at them, and there are no, rem remember what I'm saying, there are gaps in Justin Martyr. The English will even show that. The critical edition will show where there are issues in the text. Each and every one that Sam and myself has quoted does not have anything dubious about them. I've quoted it over and over, and I've quoted where it says that Otto, let me read it again. Otto has properly restored the reading of this manuscript. What does that mean? Well, let me try to summarize it. That means that in this particular area where we're reading about Christ being almighty God, that means that according to the manuscript history that we have, this is the best reading. And I've offered to go over it in the Greek. So this act of smoke and mirrors, of trying to say, well, look at this. Oh, well, there are emendations. It doesn't fly with people like us. Maybe another group of guys. It doesn't fly with us. This is not a fancy argument. This is smoke and mirrors. It, there is nothing behind it. We can go over the Greek of Justin. The original Greek is clear, is what he says about Christ being Almighty God. Then we hear more about Ignatius of Antioch. And well, you know what? The, you know, the oldest comes to this date. Good. Well, I'll take the advice of Lightfoot over you any day. And Lightfoot says we can trust what is said here. I'll take his advice over your advice pretty much any day. You know, I think one of the top uh, compilers of Ignatius in the whole universe, you know, I think his word might hold a little bit of more weight than yours. Even Ehrman would disagree with you there. Even Price, even though Price is, it, it, you know, denies the historicity of Jesus, even he would disagree with you on this part, part point. By the way, I know him personally. I know for a fact he would. These are poor arguments. And you know why, why, why they have to be resorted to him? Because when I quote Apostolic Fathers, Ignatius of Anya, Clement of Rome, uh, Justin Martyr, uh, rather than the text being dealt with, we've got, well, there's corruption. Well, look at the date. Well, look at this. We've got to be realistic. For people whose Islamic faith comes hundreds upon hundreds of years after the time of Christ, this is ridiculous. The arguments are not serious. Deal with what the Apostolic Fathers say. If there are gaps in the text, by the way, I'm using, when I quote Ignatius, I'm using the shorter recension. I've studied them all. The longer, the shorter, the middle. I'm aware of them all. I'm using the shorter one, the one that there's less doubt for. So when I'm dealing with the text, how about you engage with it rather than trying to muddy the waters? But if that's the best that you can do, then I confess I'm not surprised. Mm. Because tonight... And any night, you're not going to be able to deal with the Bible or the early fathers. And I, I'm going to give the next time period to my friend Sam so he can touch upon the true. So it's peculiar you say that an emendation does not mean corruption. But the definition of corruption is where the initial author does not actually have his words as he wanted them in the text. So it's determined by authorial intent. Plainly, conjectural emendation, conjecture without basis, emendation change to improve. Therefore, it stands to reason that it's definitely a corruption. You will know from a uh, uh, New Testament textual criticism or any textual criticism, you have to establish the basis for which the information is uh, dated. 
Once you have a terminus post poem, you can create recensions of the text. You fundamentally seem unable to understand how textual criticism works. For example, you said to me, uh, I have it in Greek. Do, do you want me to applause? You have something in Greek, whoop de doo That proves your point, it doesn't. You say, according to the manuscript reading, this is the best version. Again, you don't seem to understand, as uh, James E. Snap Jr., Sam's friend, says in his discussion with Bob the Builder, well, guess what? The best reading, according to an editor, does not mean it's the best reading overall. I draw a distinction between the NA28 GNT and its critical apparatus and the editio uh, critica mayor, the ECM, and its greater uh, body of literature from which it draws uh, variant units. So your point is therefore not only false, it's bad. Secondly, you, all you're doing is saying new Muslims are wrong, therefore I, the Christian, am right. That is simply a denial. I hope you noticed that uh, you said you trust what Lightfoot says and we can trust what he says. However, the link I put in the chat and which I sent to you said that consequently, the editing of Justin's text is almost entirely a matter of conjectural emendation, which is necessary in places, but has certainly been employed too freely by some editors. That one statement alone says to us that they have inserted words into the text too freely. That is called corruption. So you need to identify uh, at least the uh, arguments that uh, you're trying to appeal to. Uh, you also said something of, um, uh, let me see here. Islam came hundreds of years later. Unfortunately for you, my God is eternal, and therefore he can send any message from any time as he so pleases. I do not understand why you think that God is limited in when and how he reveals something. Lastly, you said, one quote and Ignatius, I'm quoting the shorter recension. Yeah, from the 9th century CE. Good job on that one. So the scholar I've quoted for you demonstrates that the early church fathers have conjectural emendations and problematic variant units, but the editors have conjectured far too freely, far too much. His words, not mine. So you're arguing against scholarship. Lastly, you said, I know Robert Price. I know Bart Ehrman. Guess what? Appeal to authority, absolutely useless. I know them both as well. In fact, Sam Shimon here mocked me for doing an interview with uh, that same guy, Robert Price. So... You're not the only one who knows these guys. Lastly, I want to point out something that you said. You said, all you're doing is asking, when is the earliest? Well, guess what? The earliest cannot come from the oral tradition because that is no longer excellent. In basic textual criticism, you either have to identify the archetype or the Osgang text. Since we no longer have the Osgang text, we have to stick to the archetype. If we have an archetype, then we have to break down whether it's a, what its genealogical tree is, what its uh, potential progenitors are, and we need to develop a system by which we can judge where the text possibly could have diverged in its multiple forms, the textual stream that is. So the point is quite simple. All I am doing is saying you assume that the tradition goes back before the extant manuscripts, but your scholarship, not mine, says that we can't trust them. I quoted Origin for you, but you failed to respond to. I quoted Dale C. Allison Jr., but you failed to respond to. I quoted C., uh, Cyril C. H. Richardson, which you failed to address. In the email I sent you, I even gave you a link to the book about Justin Matter, and that they consider the manuscript from the 16th century to be more authoritative than any other manuscript. Not my words, that's the words of the scholars, that's your problem. Try to deal with it rather than denying the argument. Thank you. Yeah, so I just want to say, Jez, it was good talking to you because the past is the past. I really enjoyed your respect and decorum, and I want to be a friend. I appreciate it as well. All right? So no, uh, what about me? No nice words for me, Sam? Yeah, no man, nice words look, for me? I don't have a history with you, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. You well, like only, well, only, well, only in your rebuttals in you know, an article form. <laughs> are you are you the, the same guy from Unveiling Christianity? Oh yeah, yeah, that's my website. Yeah, because you sound different from when I used to hear you on Pal Talk. Oh yeah, maybe because I've grown a little bit. It's okay, then don't worry. You and me are going to be buddies too. No more. The past is the past. Let's bury the past. Let's show this respectfully. We're moving forward. So I'm just going to make this my final one. Final one because the gentleman has to take medication and slate for him. So I'm going to deal with Latruo. Final one. So let me know when the time starts. My final point, and that's said and done, folks, we got to respect the time. It's late for a lot of people. So anyway, by the grace of God here, Revelation 22. I'm going to start with Revelation 22. I know if I want to quote Revelation, you're going to say, well, we don't know who wrote it and the providence. Okay, fine. I'm just going to make my case from Revelation. Okay, Revelation 22, verses 1 to 3. Then he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. <clears throat> God and the Lamb. Let me skip because of, because of time. I want to skip. I want to get to the salient points. We'll start at 3. and I'll go to 5. There shall be no more curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. The word is Latro. 
The question is, when it says his servants shall serve him, is it referring to God or the Lamb or both collectively? If I had more time, I can unpack this and show that singular pronouns are used both for God and Christ collectively. Just two examples off the top of my head. If you go to 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 16 to 17, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 to 13. But now, to prove that Jesus is definitely included in the latruo here, because the word is latruo. If you look at any lexical source, I'll tell you latruo is often associated with priestly service. It's the sacred service rendered by priest in the temple. So here, to prove that Jesus is one of those divine persons, not gods, that receives latruo, Remember, don't take my word for it. Look at the lexical source. Latro is used in reference to the sacred service in the temple by the priest. Revelation 20, verses, verse 6. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who takes part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ. God and Christ together have priests serving him. What kind of service they give? Sacrificial, temple service which is Latruo. So God and Christ have priests that give them service, and they shall reign with them a thousand years. Further proof that Jesus is included in the pronoun, that he is the object of Latruo. It says, his servants will serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their forehead. So notice, whoever this is who's being served has servants, and they will see his face, and his name will be there on their forehead. Revelation 14, verse 1. Then I looked. The Lamb was standing on Mount Zion with him, 144,000, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. So now we know the Father. His name will be written on it. But also in Revelation 3, 12, it says they'll have the name of his God and the temple of his God, and there'll be a pillar in his God, and they'll have his new name on their forehead. So Jesus is included. And does Jesus have servants in Revelation 2? Yep, Revelation 2, verses 18 to 23. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like fine brass, says these things. So the Son of God is speaking, verse 20. But I have a few things against you. You permit that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants, his servants, his name on their forehead. Serve him. He has priests. And finally, the icing on the cake, to show that Jesus is worshipped, and does receive literal and is worshipped to the extent, same extent that God the Father is worshipped, even though he's not God the Father. Revelation 5, verses 18 to 14. Revelation 5, verses 18 to 14. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. So spirit creatures are falling down before the Lamb in heaven, a vision that John sees by the Spirit. Fall down before the Lamb, each one having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. So you're worthy of this praise because of the redemption. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests unto our God and we shall reign on earth. Verses 11 to 12, quickly. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and living creatures and the elders, the voices of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, ten thousands upon ten thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and blessing. So now all the angels render to the Lamb this glory, this worship. Finally, verse 13 and 14. This is the, the, the doozy. Verse 13 and 14. Then I heard every creature which is in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that are in them. John exhausts the language. Every created thing in the entire creation saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So the Lamb is distinguished from every creature and is receiving the same worship that God the Father receives from every creature, showing He's uncreated and equal in glory and dignity to the Father. Be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever and for the same extent. And finally, verse 14, the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped Him who lives forever and ever. So Jesus with the Father is worshiped by every creature to the same degree, for the same extent, Jesus, like the Father, has his name on his servants. He has servants. Jesus, like the Father, has priests. And what do priests do? They offer latruo. So God and the Lamb have priests offering latruo. And that's Revelation. But again, who wrote Revelation? What's its providence? We don't know. I know that will be the argument. Christ is risen, risen indeed. I'm done. Thank you. That's uh, five minutes, ten seconds. I, I'm not arguing with you, but just to clarify, you started off with Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 to 3. Is that correct? Sure, sure. Okay, you said that the word latreo was mentioned there. Do you remember yep. for verse three? In verse three. 
verse 3. So it's Revelation... Okay, I'm looking, it is literal. It's right there. Yeah, it is. Second. Just give me one sec. Should I mute myself? No, no, you can see because I, I might have to ask you a follow-up question. So yes. you said Revel Revelation 22, yeah? Yes. If you read verse 3, his servants will serve him. La truo. Yeah, it's for worship. Yeah, it's Latro Susan. It's right there. Latro Susan. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the verb is used there, but yeah. okay, it's not my time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, you want to um, me, I'm going to show you conclusively Jesus is the his in the pronoun, but not to the exclusion of the father. <laughs> That's already said. Yeah, uh, there is a reason why you want to try to make that clear because I think you're familiar with the commentaries that actually. Um, disagree with uh, one another as to who actually the reference is actually in reference to it might be the father it might be the son so one second, there is are you asking me the question yeah, sure. or sure, yes no 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 sure. uh, sam just one uh, second no no uh, let me just respond okay, good. Then yes. I'll, okay should i mute myself or are you going to no, ask me no, questions i'm still asking you a question you said oh, okay, verse, okay. you said verse one has the word latreo no verse three it's right there, verse three. The, the Greek is right here. K pan. Uh, I gotta read it. Oh, yeah. Katanathema. Said, yeah, I said yeah. Okay, it's right there. Katanathema uk istai eti k o thronos tu theu k or kai tu arniu en au k astai. So there it is. The Greek is right there. So you have oh, okay. can I just yeah. mute myself and you can make your presentation. Okay. Yeah. Just give me one sec. Uh, verse three. Hmm. Uh, okay, yep, I have my response. Yep, that's all. Okay, should I just mute myself then? No more questions? Yeah, this, uh, right? yeah so yeah, this is my last All right, uh, just, you know, may God bless us all and guide us, and hopefully, we'll have future conversations be friends. Gu and guys, reach out to me. Uh, we'll set it up again. Reach out to me. We'll set it up again. We, we do yeah, this. I, 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 have, I have your information, William. Uh, do you want to do 2.5 minutes uh, uh, with uh, Splitter with Ethan or no? Yeah. yeah yeah, just, just uh, um, um, reach out to me because yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna head out as well. Reach out to me. We'll set it up again, uh, and I'll contact Sam, and we'll be back. Right. So I noticed that in Revelation chapter 22, verse three, it actually says "O two" at the end of the verse, and it seems to me that the commentators are confused whether it refers to the Lamb or it refers to God Himself, the Father. And it seems to me that if it's always used exclusively by context in the New Testament, strictly for the Father then the understanding here is that it can only refer to the Father and not the Lamb of God. What is interesting is that when you quoted Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 to 14, you actually said, worthy is the Lamb to receive. That stands out because if he's God, there is nothing he can receive, which he does not already possess. Further on, it goes on to say that, uh, saying to him who sits on the throne, you would agree that the Christ uh, does not sit on the throne, it's specifically the Father, so that's quite uh, a point against you. The God on the throne is the Father, not the person to his right hand. You know what my comment is there on that one. So it's quite peculiar that we took like 12 sessions for you to argue that the word here used in Revelation 22, 3 must apply to Jesus, but you have to acknowledge via the Greek and it refers to him who is the Father, the pronoun at the end of the sentence. Um, I want to point out as well that most of your arguments seem to be today. Uh, sorry, uh, William, how much time do I have left? uh you have got hold on i i paused it uh it, you went one minute and 15 seconds okay at 2 30 can you just stop me so i can give Evan an hour equal time i forgot to time it on my end i sure will okay thank you so uh please continue do I, I do apologize for that so the point stands thereby you were unable to qualify that christ is good and you are correct i would have asked you who wrote the uh, book of revelation was it john of patmos what is his earliest witness i believe it's a uh, uh, uncl0189 i could be wrong on that and i think that comes from the late second mid third century so it's quite peculiar that it takes a book that was disputed in the canon to qualify your point for you so if this is uh, you know what when i checked my na 28 i could not identify the uh, earliest source for it i think it's uh codex uh, sinaiticus sorry yep codex sinaiticus from the initial corrector so it seems to be a fourth century verse that you're generally appealing to if the church fathers quoted it i would have liked to see that so by and long and short is sam um, thank you for coming out tonight but i don't think you demonstrated that christ is god my suggestion is we continue this discussion tomorrow, God willing, if you and uh, William are willing to do it again. 
Ebenanwar, please take your rest of my time. Right. So uh, thank you, Sam, for your contributions. Now, there's a reason why Sam focused um, specifically on revelation and in fact, only on revelation. Why? Because although the term, the verb in question occurs several times throughout the New Testament, it occurs once in Matthew, three times in Luke, several times in Acts, in Romans, in Philippians. Yeah, Paul used this as well. And in Hebrews, I think it occurs about six, five, six times. In not a single one of those instances is it ever used of Jesus. It is always used for the Father. The word occurs only two times in Revelation. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's never used for Jesus. It's very interesting. Now, Paul, uh, sorry, Sam earlier cited um, Jesus saying that they should honor the Father as uh, they should honor Jesus as how they would honor the Father. Now, if that were the case, then we should at least find one or two instances in the Gospels or in the epistles of Paul or in Hebrews even, where one or two Christian, well, uh, Christians would actually have had given the approval to Jesus, but we do not see that ever. And in fact, John uh, James Dunn, the late James Dunn, says in his Did the First Christians Worship Jesus? The New Testament Evidence, which I am um, looking at uh, in my hand right now on page number 27. And I quote uh, in his concluding remarks, 1.6, he says, Cultic worship or service, the prayer, in parenthesis, as such is never offered to Christ. And other worship terms are used only in relation to God, and in parentheses, including Acts 13.2. End of quotation. Sam, thank you for a uh, good chat. God willing, we can continue. Thank you, buddy. Uh, God bless let's, us all. Uh, let's get it done for next week, guys. Reach out to me. Uh, Sam and myself, we'll be back. Right. There's just one problem. I don't want everyone in the room to know, but the, the owners of the room, Brother Mustafa, Brother Mukit, I actually do have an infection right now, so my strength is not the best. Uh, my so, medication makes things fuzzy for me. So I'm not going to be at my best, but I'll still try to join you, in and contribute. You, you, don't, wait, you don't have wait, corona. Listen, do you? Just wait till you're better. There's no rush. We can do it weeks from now. Nobody's rushing, so don't worry about it. Whenever no, you're ready. I, I want the conversations to continue. Uh, I thank you for your kindness, but I want it to no. continue whether I'm here or not. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully you'll be here. By the grace of God, he give you healing and guide you and guide us all. Show me a prophet, a prophet, even an angel that says, I am the life, not just the truth, who gives life and will raise them at the last hour. You can't. It's not there. Only Jesus talks like this. Perfect.